hello friends, thank you for joining our study. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the Baha'i administration. Uh, please know that this is actually a personal interpretation. It is my opinion and my understanding of the Baha'i writings. Uh, for an official view, please actually refer to the Baha'i writings themselves and jump over to Baha'i.org. Uh, in the description below, you're going to find an MP3 version of this talk, uh, a PDF with all the quotes that are actually being used, and as well, timestamps of the different sections of the talk, so you can always jump ahead or get back to where you were before. And if for any reason you would like to be alerted of upcoming videos, uh, please click subscribe. So now we're going to be going into where often discussions about the world beyond get slightly uncomfortable, which has to do with judgment and the concepts of heaven and hell. The souls of the infidels, however, shall, and to this I bear witness, when breathing their last, be made aware of the good things that have escaped them, and shall bemoan their plight, and shall humble themselves before God. They shall continue doing so after the separation of their souls from their bodies. It is clear and evident that all men shall, after their physical death, estimate the worth of their deeds, and realize all that their hands have wrought. I swear by the day star that shineth above the horizon of divine power, they that are the followers of the one true God shall, the moment they depart out of this life, experience such joy and gladness as would be impossible to describe, while they that live in error shall be seized with such fear and trembling, and shall be filled with such consternation as nothing can exceed. Well is it with him that hath quaffed the choice and incorruptible wine of faith through the gracious favor and the manifold bounties of him who is the Lord of all faiths. So uh, in this passage, Baha'u'llah tells us that we will be made aware of the good things that have escaped us and bemoan our plight. If we are, and the term used is infidel. I want to address this term because uh, it's not commonly used in the Baha'i writings, but it is something that is uh, evokes a lot of emotion. So before we move forward, I'd like to address it. Uh, what is an infidel? Um, the association we have is very, very harsh, when its actual term simply means infidelity. One who has not kept a trust one who has not kept a covenant. So it's important that when we encounter it, um, that we try to understand what it actually means, as opposed to the terrible things we often think of. Because it means that we ourselves had a marriage, if you will. We ourselves had a covenant of love and trust and union with one that we have broken. In a sense, we have broken a covenant with the purpose for which we have been created, a bond of love and union between humanity and God, and humanity and humanity. Uh, in this passage, it is very clear that there is a judgment, and that it is, if you will, visceral. One will see the things, and it says the good things that have escaped them, bemoan their plight, Whereas others will experience such joy and gladness that it would be impossible to describe. And that they live in error be seized with such fear and trembling. So there is an event, and again, I know of no religion really that does not include this concept, that there is an event that when we move from this world to the world beyond, uh, there is a reckoning. We are held to account for the things that we did or didn't do in this life. By God, wert thou to realize what thou hast done, thou wouldst surely weep sore over thyself, and wouldst flee for refuge to God, and wouldst pine away and mourn all the days of thy life, till God will have forgiven thee, for he verily is the most generous, the all-bountiful. Thou wilt, however, persist till the hour of thy death, in thy heedlessness. Inasmuch as thou hast with all thine heart 
thine soul and inmost being, busy thyself with the vanities of the world. Thou shalt, after thy departure, discover what we have revealed unto thee, and shalt find all thy doings recorded in the book, wherein the works of all them that dwell on earth, be they greater or less than the weight of an atom, are noted down. This other quote just simply tells us once again that they will see all that has been revealed and find all their doings recorded in a book. That we really are going to face the choices we made in this life. This is actually why Baha'u'llah says in the Hidden Words, O Son of Being, bring thyself to account each day, ere thou art summoned to a reckoning. For death, unheralded, shall come upon thee, and thou shalt be called to give account for thy deeds. In this passage, he's telling us to bring ourself to account. And it's something often that I, I think people forget in the writings of Baha'u'llah, that we are asked to take account of our deeds every day. And because we are going to be brought towards a reckoning. So the more mindful, the more... Uh, aware and conscious we are of our deeds, and if you will, the value of our deeds, the degree of value hierarchy, the either high or low nature that is being expressed, this will enable us to avoid having to take account of our deeds when we pass. While the judgment um, of God, and I would propose the judgment of ourselves, uh, is a real aspect of our passage from one world to the next, um, there's an important principle that I think we should take note of. Worship thou God in such wise, that if thy worship lead thee to fire, no alteration in thy adoration would be produced. And so likewise, if thy recompense should be paradise, thus and thus alone should be the worship which befitteth the one true God. Shouldst thou worship him because of fear, this would be unseemly in the sanctified court of his presence, and could not be regarded as an act by thee dedicated to the oneness of his being. Or if thy gaze should be on paradise, and thou should worship him while cherishing such a hope, thou wouldst make God's creation a partner with him notwithstanding the fact that paradise is desired by many. Fire and paradise both bow down and prostrate themselves before God. That which is worthy of his essence is to worship him for his sake, without fear of fire or hope of paradise. Although when true worship is offered, the worshipper is delivered from the fire and entereth the paradise of God's good pleasure. Yet such should not be the motive of his act. However, God's favor and grace ever flow in accordance with the ex exigencies of his inscrutable wisdom. This quote from the Bob is beautiful because it speaks of how if we were to worship God in hope of heaven, or of fear of fire, that this would make God's creation, the worlds of God beyond, and the states and conditions we can occupy, a partner with him. This again in itself is a very, very, very rich notion, and a, I believe, a deep philosophical principle, possibly to be explore, explored later. But it's important that we understand that though judgment may exist, it is not that we act out justice and mercy and compassion, or seek God and seek love and seek knowledge of the divine world and to spread his fragrances everywhere for the rewards of the next life. And that we don't avoid lying and vulgarity and the hurting of another human soul because we will be punished for it. It's actually to be done, right, for its own sake. For example, you naturally hope uh, for your, the love and gratitude of your children. You want them to love you and to reciprocate. 
but you yourself serve them and sacrifice aspects of your life and potentially even your literal life for them, not so you can get that love back from them. It is just the beauty of love and justice and mercy and serving another being that drives a true parent sentiment. Likewise, in this case, when you see, for example, um, say you wanted to be an amazing violinist, and that's what you hoped for, and you get praised by your teacher, and you actually get sort of scolded when you don't do what you're supposed to be doing or living up to your potential, you're actually learning the violin for the beauty of the violin itself and for the expression of that music, I believe, if you're an elevated psyche. And while you might get judgment and reward from your teacher, it's not the reason that you go to violin lessons. So we now move on to the notion of heaven and hell. Is there a hell? There is a hell in Baha'i scripture. The word hell. And there is a hell um, pretty much in every revelation that I know, and the concept of a place of punishment, or a state of punishment. I've heard Baha'i say we don't believe in hell at certain times, and I do understand why that might be said. Because the individual that we're speaking to has a definition of what that word means. Just like the definition of infidel. It comes packed with all these ideas. But the definition of what that is in the scriptures is a different question compared to how we have defined it in our mind. So at times it's difficult, someone will say to me, do you believe in hell? And I kind of, oh, okay. And I have a sigh because, well, the, what you're asking me is, do I believe in a picture that you currently have in your mind that you attach the word hell to? <laughs> and if I answer with a simple yes, and I've had individuals as I begin to answer say, I just want to know yes or no. But if I say yes to them, the answer is yes to the picture and understanding that you have in your mind. Because you're asking the definition of hell, do you believe that? So the Baha'i definition of hell and heaven is actually very, very rich, philosophically and spiritually. So, but in the end, is there the word hell? <laughs> and do we believe in it? Yes. What that is, we're going to explore. Were these people to shake off the slumber of negligence and realize that which their hands have wrought, they would surely perish and would of their own accord cast themselves into fire, their end and real abode. This first quote, however, has a very fascinating aspect that relates to this state of judgment that we were just looking at. It said they would of their own accord cast themselves into fire, their end and real abode. Two things, one, that in the state and process of, an, of a being actually advancing uh, into the worlds beyond, that when faced with what they had done, they would cast them, their own selves into the fire. And I would suggest this is because they are actually seeing the reality that they are, the true capacity of their being, whether that uh, process of judgment be in an instant and forgotten or stretched out through time, um, the soul comes to a place where it realizes what it has done, the true implications of what it has done, and would judge itself. And it's interesting here because it says their end and real abode. And I think these are two different things. <laughs> one is uh, where they will be, and one is, as I think we will see, where they have already come from. What I desire, however, O oh my God, is that thou shouldst bid me unveil the things which lie hid in thy knowledge, so that they who are wholly devoted to thee may, in their longing for thee, soar up into the atmosphere of thy oneness, and the infidels may be seized with trembling and may return to the nethermost fire, the abode ordained for them by thee through the power of thy sovereign might. So here in this passage from Baha'u'llah in Prayers and Meditations, again we see the term infidel. Um, and we've looked at this already. But I think what's important here is it says, 
they may be seized with trembling and return to the nethermost fire. It's not that they're actually going into the nethermost fire, that they may seize, be seized with trembling and return to their real abode in the end, if you will. In order to, to, uh, to better understand this, I think we have to look at what is heaven and what is hell. There is certainly a future life. Heaven and hell are conditions within our own beings. So hell, heaven and hell are states of being. They are not something external to us. They are conditions within our own beings. What is this paradise of heaven and hell? The Bob. I affirm that no paradise is more sublime for my creatures than to stand before my face and to believe in my holy words. While no fire has been or will be fiercer for them than to be veiled from the manifestation of my exalted self and to disbelieve in my words. I think it's really important often that when we encounter concepts within Baha'i writings or any writings, that when we have something definitional like this, we don't pass very quickly over it. What does the Bob say here? There is no paradise more sublime. So no paradise is more sublime than to believe in his words and stand before his face. And it says no fire hath been or will be fiercer. So there is no fire that you can think of that has been or will be fiercer than being veiled from the manifestation of God. So whenever you begin to think of some paradise more sublime, when you encounter the concept of paradise, or in any in image of hell, there is no fire that hath been or ever will be fiercer than separation from the real purpose of one's existence and union with the Beloved. And again, the Bob says, There is no paradise more wondrous for any soul than to be exposed to God's manifestation in his day, to hear his verses and believe in them, to attain his presence, which is not but the presence of God, to sail upon the sea of the heavenly kingdom of his good pleasure, and to partake of the choice fruits of the paradise of his divine oneness. Is there a paradise more wondrous than being exposed to God's manifestation in his day? This is like Ruhi. No, there is no paradise more wondrous. Once again, that heaven is not a place. It is a state and condition within our own being. They say, where is paradise and where is hell? Say, the one is reunion with me, the other thine own self. O thou who dost associate a partner with God and doubtest. Here in Baha'u'llah's writings, he says, where is paradise and one, where is hell? One is reunion, the other is your own self. And now this is a notion that actually, I think, comes up over and over and over again when we do studies of the state and station of the human being itself. We are, in our true self, a reflection of the divine being of the manifestation of God. That manifestation of God itself is actually a image, the perfect image of the Supreme Deity. And we can either polish the mirror, an analogy often used within the Baha'i writings and others, and see the image of that light, or we can look to the frame of the mirror and actually ignore the light it is. That our own will, our own, if you will, base or lower nature, is hell here. Whereas that actual good pleasure or reunion with God, coming to a realization of our true self, is heaven. It's not how we go to heaven, it is heaven. As to paradise, it is a reality and there can be no doubt about it. And now in this world, it is realized through love of me and my good pleasure. Whosoever attaineth unto it, God will aid him in this world below, 
and after death he will enable him to gain admittance into paradise, whose vastness is as that of heaven and earth. So Baha'u'llah is telling us that this um, paradise is actually realized through love of God, love of God's manifestation, and his good pleasure. O ye lovers of God, be kind to all peoples, care for every person, do all ye can to purify the hearts and minds of men. Strive ye to gladden every soul. To every meadow be a shower of grace. To every tree the water of life. Be as sweet musk to the sense of humankind. And to the alien be a fresh restoring breeze. Be pleasing water to all those who thirst. A careful guide to all who have lost their way. Be father and mother to the orphan. Be loving sons and daughters to the old. Be an abundant treasure to the poor. Think ye of love and good fellowship as the delights of heaven. Think ye of hostility and hatred as the torments of hell. Once again, we have here from the writings of Abdu Baha a beautiful poetic verse. And he tells us that we are to think of love and good fellowship as the delights of heaven, his good pleasure, embodying the light of the sun in the mirror of our own self, and hostility and hatred as the torments of hell. And I would suggest, again, these are the same themes, the separation. I know there's a famous Zen story where actually a samurai is walking through the forest and he comes upon a monk and he starts mocking this monk. Um, and when actually he says to this monk, you know, well, why don't you show me the world beyond paradise of heaven, you know, and show me hell if what you say is true. And the monk looks at him and he actually just begins insulting him, calling him a fool, a moron, a lazy. And all of a sudden this uh, warrior actually gets furious and he pulls out his sword. And then as soon as he has all this rage and anger on his face, the monk says, there is hell. And then this moment, the... Uh, the warrior actually realizes that actually the hostility and aggression and hatred and anger are themselves the definition of hell. That he lives in torment in such a state. And in this moment he realizes the beauty of the Buddhist teachings and has a sense of inner peace. And the monk says, and this is heaven. But this is a famous story, again, long, long predating the body. Uh, definition, and we have other examples all through other scriptures, and if you will, parables. And it's this is what we're supposed to be trying to understand. That it's not that there is some other hell that we go to being separated from the very purpose of our existence. Uh, that is the hell that we're already in. Through these rewards, he gains spiritual birth and becomes a new creature. He becomes the manifestation of the verse in the Gospel, where it is said of the disciples that they were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That is to say, they were delivered from the animal characteristics and qualities, which are the characteristics of human nature, and they became qualified with the divine characteristics, which are the bounty of God. This is the meaning of the second birth. For such people there is no greater torture than being veiled from God, and no more severe punishment than sensual vices, dark qualities, lowness of nature, engrossment and carnal desires. When they are delivered through the light of faith from the darkness of these vices, and become illuminated with the radiance of the sun of reality, and ennobled with all the virtues, they esteem this the greatest reward, and they know it to be the true paradise. In the same way they consider that the spiritual punishment, that is to say the torture and punishment of existence, is to be subjected in the, to the world of nature, to be veiled from God, to be brutal and ignorant, to fall into carnal lust, 
to be absorbed in animal frailties, to be characterized with dark qualities, such as falsehood, tyranny, cruelty, attachment to the affairs of the world, and being immersed in satanic ideas. For them, these are the greatest punishments and tortures. Likewise, the rewards of the world are the eternal life, which is clearly mentioned in all the holy books, the divine perfections, the eternal bounties, and everlasting felicity. The rewards of the other world are the perfections and the peace obtained in the spiritual worlds after leaving this world, whilst the rewards of this life are the real luminous perfections which are realized in this world and which are the cause of eternal life, for they are the very progress of existence. It is like the man who passes from the embryonic world to the state of maturity, and becomes the manifestation of these words, Blessed be God, the best of creators. The rewards of the other world are peace, the spiritual graces, the various spiritual gifts in the kingdom of God the gaining of the desires of the heart and the soul, and the meeting of God in the world of eternity. In the same way, the punishments of the other world, that is to say, the torments of the other world, consist in being deprived of this special divine blessings and the absolute bounties, and falling into the lowest degrees of existence, he who is deprived of these divine favors, although he continues after death, is considered as dead by the people of truth. In this passage, Abdu'l-Baha talks about the second birth, our recreation, if you will, into the spiritual perfections when one recognizes the manifestation of God. And he says that to such people, uh, quote, no greater torture than being veiled from God, no more severe punishment and sensual vices, dark qualities, lowness of nature, engrossment in carnal desires. And again, is there any more severe punishment? Just answering the quote, no, there is not. <laughs> and as it continues, that the rewards of this world are the perfections and the peace, the real luminous perfections, which are realized in this world. That there is a heaven and hell isn't something over there, some place we go to, but rather as a state or being, a state of being or condition of our own selves. I know for myself, I've often thought of having, you know, if you had two identical twins and they're both standing on the main street of a city, and these two brothers grew up together, and one of the brothers himself has dedicated his life, let's say, to the arts, to the sciences. He strives to I don't know, uplift the soul of every person that he meets in his life. He serves his community, tries to promote global integration. His life is really focused and directed towards all of that which is beautiful and valuable in this life. And now standing beside him on this street corner is his identical twin brother, shoulder to shoulder. And this brother of his actually runs a prostitution ring. This individual sells methamphetamines, heroin, and crack cocaine. This individual will at any time utilize his physical prowess through violence, his voice in anger and manipulation, that every facet of his life is actually turned towards selfish and sensual desires. His, the qualities of justice, of mercy, and compassion are injustice of being Neglectful, really, of everything that he possibly could have been in a process of bettering the world through bettering himself. In a sense, I guess, by definition, the one brother is in heaven and the one brother is in hell. It's the state or condition of these psyches. Now, one might turn and say, well, but this brother doesn't feel he is in hell. This is a theme that's going to come up quite quickly. No, he doesn't know he's in hell but he is actually caged in his lower nature. 
his true self, if you will, that image of divine light that can be reflected in the person of our own selves, has actually been clouded over, not with dust, but with mud, just covered and drenched so that it cannot be seen. And it's, it's interesting, I put them in my mind in, on, you know, shoulder to shoulder and identical twins because physically they look the same. In location, they're almost as, as actually close as they can be. But the least important thing about these individuals is that they're standing side by side and they look identical. They are actually, I would suggest, worlds apart. They actually inhabit different worlds. One of anger, of hatred, of manipulation, of selfishness, and a lack of caring for the hearts, minds, bodies, and souls of others. The other in a world where what is real to him, if you will, is actually the virtues, knowledge, and the progress of humankind. This next quote is from Abdu'l-Baha. The root cause of wrongdoing is ignorance, and we must therefore hold fast to the tools of perception and knowledge. Good character must be taught, light must be spread afar, so that, in the school of humanity, all may acquire the heavenly characteristics of the Spirit, and see for themselves beyond any doubt that there is no fiercer hell, no more fiery abyss, than to possess a character that is evil and unsound, no more darksome pit, nor loathsome torment, than to show forth qualities which deserve to be condemned. The individual must be educated to such a high degree that he would rather have his throat cut than tell a lie, and would think it easier to be slashed with a sword or pierced with a spear than to utter calumny or be carried away by wrath. In this passage we again meet this definition that there is no fiercer hell, no more fiery abyss than to possess a character that is evil and unsound. And that I, I often, in, in deep things, will say to, that we please really, really try and understand what is being said here. Not just understand conceptually, but emotionally. These are the two brothers standing on the street corner. That actually there is no more fiercer hell, no more fiery abyss than the one that brother is in at that moment. And the gravity of actually this, this um, the real station of humankind, why Baha'u'llah says we wish to cast away our life if we were to actually see the true beauty of what we can actually be, is actually reflected in the imageries of heaven and hell. And in here, uh, the individual must be educated to such a high degree that he would rather have his throat cut than tell a lie. This is a very graphic image, as often images of hell can be in certain scriptures. It's trying to impress indelibly, sorry, it's trying to impress indelibly on the heart and mind of humankind how horrid it is for when we are capable of soaring in the skies to writher and slither in the dust. As to thy question, doth every soul without exception achieve life everlasting? Know thou that immortality belongeth to these souls, in whom hath been breathed the spirit of life from God. All save these are lifeless, they are the dead, even as Christ hath explained in the Gospel text. He whose eyes the Lord hath opened will see the souls of men in stations they will occupy after their release from the body. He will find the living ones thriving within the precincts of their Lord, and the dead sunk down in the lowest abyss of perdition. Know thou that every soul is fashioned after the nature of God, each being pure and holy at his birth. Afterwards, however, the individuals will vary according to what they acquire of virtues or vices in this world. Although all existent beings are in their very nature created in ranks or degrees 
for capacities are various. Nevertheless, every individual is born holy and pure, and only thereafter may he become defiled. And further, although the degrees of being are various, yet all are good. Observe the human body, its limbs, its members, the eye, the ear, the organs of smell, of taste, the hands, the fingernails. Notwithstanding the differences among all these parts, each one, within the limitations of its own being, participateth in a coherent whole. So in the first paragraph of this passage, this is a definition that we see as it's stated um, within the Gospels, the New Testament. Uh, Let the dead bury their dead is the famous quote when an individual wants to go back and settle some of his affairs. Um, the dead here is not referring to physical death, uh, just as fire, as we see, is not re actually referring to physical fire, but rather we're looking at a definition that when we are not alive to the reality that is truly within us, we are dead. We might be physically alive, but we have turned our mirror from the sun towards the cold reaches of space, away from light, and are not reflecting the true beauties. And I want to stress again, knowledge, right? understanding the realities of our universe, as we saw previously, really expressing all the fragrances, if you will, of the human condition in knowledge and love and justice and compassion and self-sacrifice, philanthropic deeds, each of these. Um, and he says that he whose eyes have opened, right, the Lord has opened, quote, will see the souls of men in the stations they will occupy after their release from the body. He will find the living ones thriving within the precincts of their Lord and the dead sunk down in the lowest abyss of perdition. And I think it's interesting because he says, for one whose eyes have opened, he will see the souls of men, right, in the stations they will occupy after their death. And there's two ways to read this. One is that you'll actually see what they will be like later, but you don't see it now. Meaning it's not here. Or we can say he will see in this moment the station they will occupy after they die. Meaning the station they are currently occupying is the same station they're going to occupy, which is being in the depths of perdition in hell for which there is no fiercer hell, or fire more abysmal, if you will, which is the station of being encaged or imprisoned within one's lower nature, and not even aware that we actually have one. You are witnessing it on the, on the plane of history now, what you shall witness there. A soul not aware of the manifestation of God, of God, and therefore of his own nature. As to paradise, it is a reality and there can be no doubt about it. And now in this world, it is realized through love of me and my good pleasure. Whosoever attaineth unto it, God will aid him in the world below, and after death he will enable him to gain admittance into paradise, whose vastness is as that of heaven and earth. Therein the maids of glory and holiness will wait upon him in the daytime, and in the night season, while the day star of the unfading beauty of his Lord will at all times shed its radiance upon him, and he will shine so brightly that no one shall bear to gaze at him. Such is the dispensation of providence. Yet the people are shut out by a grievous veil. Likewise apprehend thou the nature of hellfire, and be of them that truly believe. For every act performed there shall be a recompense according to the estimate of God, and unto this the very ordinances and prohibitions prescribed by the Almighty amply bear witness. For surely if deeds were not rewarded and yielded no fruit, then the cause of God, exalted is he, would prove futile. Immeasurably high is he exalted above such blasphemies. However, unto them that are rid of all attachments, a deed is, verily, its own reward. Were we to enlarge 
upon this theme, numerous tablets would need to be written. So in this passage, as to paradise, it is a reality. And there can be no doubt. And he says, and now in this world, it is love of the manifestation and the good pleasure of God. Say the love of Christ and his good pleasure, the adoration and homage paid to the Buddha and the following of his Dharma. And in this sense, it's defined as there is a heaven here, and it is actually following the teachings. And then there is a heaven there, right? As it says, a paradise whose vastness is that of heaven and earth. And that that individual will meet celestial beings and are shining brilliantly, if you will. But also there is the nature of hellfire, which again is to be cut off, to be separated from, and actually to be, if you will, uh, given the desserts that you yourself have chosen in this life. right? And here it's stated that if this principle of judgment itself was not uh, a reality of the world, then the entire causes of the manifestation would prove completely fruitless. There is no paradise in the estimation of the believers in the divine unity more exalted than to obey God's commandments. And there is no fire in the eyes of those who have known God and his signs, fiercer than to transgress his laws and to oppress another soul, even to the extent of a mustard seed. On the day of resurrection, God will in truth judge all men, and we all verily plead for his grace. So again, is there a paradise more exalted? Is there a fire more fierce? No. To transgress the laws and to oppress another soul. So once again, this concept of oppressing one's own self to transgress the law of God, and then to oppress another individual. The fifth question concerning the bridge of Sirat, paradise and hell. The prophets of God have come in truth and have spoken the truth. Whatsoever the messenger of God hath announced hath been and will be made manifest. The world is established upon the foundations of reward and punishment. Knowledge and understanding have ever affirmed and will continue to affirm the reality of paradise and hell. For reward and punishment require their existence. Paradise signifieth first and foremost the good pleasure of God. Whosoever attaineth his good pleasure is reckoned and recorded among the inhabitants of the most exalted paradise, and will attain, after the ascension of his soul, that which pen and ink are powerless to describe. For them that are endued with insight, and have fixed their gaze upon the most sublime vision, the bridge, the balance, paradise, hellfire, and all that hath been mentioned and recorded in the sacred scriptures are clear and manifest. At the time of the appearance and manifestation of the rays of the day star of truth, all occupy the same station. God then proclaimeth that which he willeth, and whoso heareth his call and acknowledgeth his truth is accounted among the inhabitants of paradise. Such a soul hath traversed the bridge the balance, and all that hath been recorded regarding the day of resurrection, and hath reached its destination. The day of God's revelation is a day of the most great resurrection. It says here that when we are actually looking at the bridge of Sirat, which is the bridge one, one, ha one has to cross after death, to see whether they end up in heaven and hell in Islam, or the Chinvat bridge, I believe it is, in, in Zoroastrianism, that these, this bridge we have to cross, this paradise and hell, are real. There is reward and punishment, right? And now at the same time, paradise first and foremost, uh, he says, signifieth the good pleasure of God. Nevertheless, what the, the individual experiences after, if you will, living in heaven in this world, is to be passing into this celestial body made up of these elements, that has actually been developed while in this world through the use of our heart, our minds, and uh, 
all that we have, our will, if you will, in service of the good, then builds that elemental body which has a different conception of space, but has space, has a different conception of time, but still has chronology, if you will. At the time of the appearance of the manifestation of God, Baha'u'llah is telling us that all occupy the same station, they're all given the ability to recognize. Once that happens, those who hear his call recognize in the words and teachings of the manifestation of God the true higher reality of their own self, answers that call, it says, he is in truth accounted amongst the inhabitants of paradise. Once this occurs, we are in paradise. And it says he has traversed the bridge, the balance, and all that has been recorded regarding the day of resurrection. That this actually is the resurrection of a being when they transfer from, if you will, base copper into gold through the process of recognizing what they truly are. Uh, think again of the twins, you know, standing on Main Street. If this end of these two individuals, one, if you will, being lead and another being gold, one being completely encapsulated and actually bound within his own vices, within his own sensual desires and selfishness, to the degree will he will oppress another soul, well he will harm anyone around him to get what he wishes. This other soul who is a complete utter servant of humankind, and again a servant of the arts and sciences. If this one brother on this side suddenly transformed, recognizing that he himself had a real purpose in life, and it was to carry for an ever advancing civilization. To make the earth one country with mankind its citizens. To actually bring forward the best that he can in his own self and give that light to the world, in some sense he really is not the same person. And that individual has actually been resurrected in the Most Great Resurrection, and has crossed the bridge, narrowly made, and fallen into heaven as opposed to hell. We have to remember that this day of the resurrection, this uh, pa crossing of the Sirat bridge, is to the capacity, this is what it's saying, all occupy the same station, and God proclaims that which he willeth, and whoso heareth his call and acknowledges it. Those who actually have the opportunity to hear it in its early stages, and then answer. <clears throat> we are told uh, over and over within the Baha'i writings that God's mercy exceeds his justice. And that also that the revelations of God are represented such that um, given that all of our capacities are different, some, as Abdu'l-Bah says, as small as in the cup of a hand, another a full gallon measure. We all have different degrees of discernment, different degrees of intelligence, different degrees of capacity, and we are not actually to berate one for having been created in a, without the same amount of capacity in this world, but rather the revelations of God are actually transmitted to humankind within, with, with contents within it to answer the hearts and minds of all different natures, both from the philosopher to the most simplest. And we'll start with a quick quote from Shoghi Effendi and another one from Abdu'l-Bah. There is certainly a future life. Heaven and hell are conditions within our own beings. Now punishments and rewards are said to be of two kinds. First, the rewards and punishments of this life. Second, those of the other world. But the paradise and hell of existence are found in all the worlds of God, whether in this world or in the spiritual heavenly worlds. Gaining these rewards is the gaining of eternal life. So in the first quote, uh, which we've seen an aspect of before, that heaven and hell are conditions within our own beings. This is what we've been looking at. What's interesting is, is in the second quote we've heard, from Abdu'l-Bah, he says this, The paradise and hell of existence are found where? In all the worlds of God, whether in this world, or in the spiritual heavenly worlds. And if we gain the rewards of these heavenly worlds, this is what is mean by uh, sorry, this is what is meant uh, by eternal life. We'll look at this aspect of the many worlds of God very, very shortly, 
But here I want to note, where are heaven and hell found? Are they found only in this world? Only in the next world? No, there are conditions with their own beings, and in every world, again, found in all the worlds of God. In every single world, there will be a heaven, and there will be a hell. Another aspect of where is heaven, where is hell, we find that they're in each of the worlds of God. But let us read another passage from Abdu'l-Baha. And the answer to the fourth question, the center of the Son of Truth is in the supernal world, the kingdom of God. Those souls who are pure and unsullied, upon the dissolution of their elemental frames, hasten away to the world, world of God. And that world is within this world. The people of this world, however, are unaware of that world, and are even as the mineral and the vegetable that know nothing of the world of the animal and the world of man. Note in this passage, again, Abdu baha says, that world speaking of the next world, is within this world. And then he gives an example that people are unaware of that world, even as the mineral and the vegetable know nothing of the world of the animal and the world of man. This is a theme that really, really recurs, actually, in especially the talks of Abdu baha that we are living in a world right now where I can actually have a stone floor in front of me, and actually a plant on the windowsill, a little puppy dog running around, and I myself, for example, am studying physics. <laughs> and in this world, each of these have an existence. They all have an access to existence, but there are as barriers of, of awareness. The plant, for example, might note that something got in the way of its sunlight, but couldn't tell if it was a person holding a piece of paper, or it was a cloud far, far up in the sky. There is at least to some degree a sensing, but to think that that degree of sensing itself is like sight, or hearing, or taste, or smell. It is a radically different way of accessing the world. Even the mineral itself, it exists and the plant exists. The mineral itself doesn't grow, doesn't develop, it doesn't recreate copies of itself, give life to the world, fragrance, all these, right? Um, they each have their place. Even when you go to the animal, a dog, for example, is running around my house right now, that dog might know me, be able to interact with me for to certain degrees, but if I'm standing there doing physics, for example, it has no access to the realm of abstract thought, of scientific endeavor, of the creation of the arts. There is such a radical difference between me and this animal, but there's a radical difference between that animal and that plant, or that plant and the tile, stone tile of my kitchen floor. And in such a case, we all occupy the same world. And we're told by Abdu Paul quite often, actually, in his writings and his, and his talks, that the world that we call the heavenly worlds is not a separate place. They're stacked on top of each other, just like mineral, animal, plant, and human. One of the questions that I think arises here is that it says that the paradise and hell that is found in all the worlds of God, whether in this world or the, or the spiritual world, Gaining the rewards of these, the paradise in each of those worlds, is what is meant by eternal life. So this is what I would want to turn to. All the keys of heaven God has chosen to place on my right hand, and all the keys of hell on my left. I am the primal point from which have been generated all created things. I am the countenance of God, whose splendor can never be obscured, the light of God whose radiance can never fade. Whoso recognizeth me, assurance and all good are in store for him. And whoso faileth to recognize me, infernal fire and all evil await him. By the righteousness of him who is the absolute truth, were the veil to be lifted, thou wouldst witness on this earthly plane all men sorely afflicted with the fire of the wrath of God, 
a fire fiercer and greater than the fire of hell, with the exception of those who have sought shelter beneath the shade of the tree of my love. For they, in very truth, are the blissful. So in this passage, I just get, I broke it up a little bit for context. The Bob is saying he is the primal point, from which, through which have been generated all created things, the heavenly manifestation of God, reflected in the person of the Bob on this world, in this world. But then he says, he gives the example of um, infernal fire and paradise, and then states. And were the veil to be lifted, you would witness what? All men sorely afflicted with the fire of the wrath of God, a fire fiercer and greater than the fire of hell. Once again, this is in this world. He's saying in recognition of him, if he were to lift the veil for you, you would witness the people of the world currently in the fires of hell. These people it's being stated, are in a state of hell and are completely unaware that they are. They don't know. And I want to hold on to this theme for a while. Since that day is a great day, it would be sorely trying for thee to identify thyself with the believers. For the believers of that day are the inmates of paradise, while the unbelievers are the inmates of the fire. And know thou of a certainty that by paradise is meant recognition of and submission unto him whom God shall make manifest, and by the fire the company of such souls as would fail to submit unto him, or to be resigned to his good pleasure. On that day thou wouldst regard thyself as the inmate of paradise and as a true believer in him, whereas in reality, Thou wouldst suffer thyself to be wrapped in veils, and thy habitation would be the nethermost fire, though thou thyself wouldst not be cognizant thereof. This is a pivotal quote for me, actually. Completely pivotal. Uh, the reason why is because he gives us our example that the believers in that day are in paradise, while the unbelievers are the inmates of the fire. It's not that they will, again, be the inmates of the fire. They are the inmates of the fire. They've been cut, up, uh, cut, a, cut off from the very purpose of their existence. But then he says, um, by paradise is meant what? The recognition of the message of God and turning unto it and submitting unto it, turning your mirror unto the sun. And then he says, and by the fire... The company of such souls as would fail to submit unto him, or be resigned to his good pleasure. So what is the fire? Being allowed to be in the state of being careless, of not caring of others, and of being able to be surrounded by people that are like you. I often think of, for example, I say a very extreme example would be like, you know, like a Cuban drug lord, right? Or a Colombian drug lord who, on the outside, has these amazing power boats, yachts, beautiful mansions. Around him are all these beautiful women. He's all happy. He has everything that the sensuality of himself would desire. He can have the most expensive alcohols. You know what I mean? The most expensive cigars. And his whim are, if you will, chemicals that he can adjust at any moment to pseudo-uplift his heart and mind. For many people, they see this and they would actually think like, wow, that man has the life. And such individuals will gravitate towards him. You know in such a picture, like a Scarface, a Tony Montana from Scarface, you have him surrounded by others like him. And they all look to him and they want what he has, the power of life and death over people, the ability to buy off judges, police, and politicians, and what many people still today think of as living the life. And yet he's in hell, surrounded by fire. The hell is the state and condition of his own being. And what are the flames of the fire? Actually, the people that look up to him. 
the people that want what he wants. And will actually turn to him in longing. And he can see their longing faces looking up at him. That they want to be him. They respect, if you will, a pseudo-respect, a pseudo-admiration, a pseudo-attraction from a pseudo-prophet. Who is actually himself the object of envy, and he sees admiration. Object of lust, and he sees love. He confuses them. This is actually what I think is being communicated to us by the Bob in passages like this, and by Baha'u'llah. It's that this individual says, On that day thou wouldst regard thyself as the inmate of paradise, and a true believer. And yet, in reality, thou wouldst suffer thyself to be wrapped in the veils, and the habitation would be the nethermost fire, and thyself would not be cognizant thereof. And this is really the important if you will, cardinal point of this section, you can be in hell and have no idea that you are. And in a sense, when one is actually turning away from the manifestation of God, turning away from the teachings that are to actually resound with his heart and mind, with the very purpose or teleology of human existence, when a person is not in sync with this, that they can think that everything in their life is wonderful, be in the fire and not cognizant thereof. Another theme that is going to come up again over and over in subsequent sections of this deepening is actually the lure of happiness. And we're going to see that actually what we often mean by our pursuit of happiness can actually be the flames of fire that we're supposed to be avoiding. And likewise he saith, Recognize him by his verses. The greater your neglect in seeking to know him, the more grievously will ye be veiled in fire. The reason why I chose this passage explicitly is because it actually says the greater your neglect in seeking to know him. There are many souls in the history of religion, in the history of our world, who never would have had the chance to hear this, the message of the Prophet Muhammad, or the Buddha, or Jesus Christ, or Baha'u'llah, or the Bab. The question is, is, is an individual in such a, in such a situation seeking? But even those who actually encounter, what is being asked is, will this individual put forward effort to find the purpose and goal of human existence? Or is this a something that is seen automatically as something to be brushed off? Or something to be ignored when, if you will, the itch comes? <laughs> you know what I mean? When you suddenly are wondering, well, what if? What if there is some greater purpose? It's actually that the more you neglect to seek, the more grievous you will be veiled in fire. And, and again, I would stress, what is that fire, right? That fire is baser desires, carnal lusts, being actually, um, if you will, almost like covered in the dust or dross, right? That obscures the true nature of what we're at, or sorry, of what we should be. But at the same time, we generally associate with those like unto us. So the flames of the fire are generally those who agree with us in our worldly pursuits when a world out there suffers and longs for deliverance from its suffering, when there are the fruits of compassion and love and justice and mercy, of understanding the universe, of education and intellectual enlightenment and the arts in service of the beauty of humankind. Know thou that thou wilt succeed in doing so, if thou believest with undoubting faith. However, since thou canst not attain the state of undoubting faith due to the intervening veils of thy selfish desires, therefore thou wilt tarry in the fire, though realizing it not. What does the Bob say in this passage? Thou wilt tarry in the fire, though realizing it not. We can be in hell and have no idea we're in it. Uh, the following is a quote from Promulgation of Universal Peace by Abdu'l-Baha. 
In the matrix of the mother, the unborn child was deprived and unconscious of the world of material existence. But after its birth, it beheld the wonders and beauties of a new realm of life and being. In the world of the matrix, it was utterly ignorant and unable to conceive of these new conditions. But after its transformation, it discovers the radiant sun, trees, flowers, and an infinite range of blessings and bounties awaiting it. In the human plane and kingdom, man is a captive of nature and ignorant of the divine world until born of the breasts of the Holy Spirit out of physical conditions of limitation and deprivation. Then he beholds the reality of the spiritual realm and kingdom, realizes the narrow restrictions of the mere human world of existence, and becomes conscious of the unlimited and infinite glories of the world of God. Therefore, no matter how man may advance upon the physical and intellectual plane, he is ever in need of the boundless virtues of divinity, the protection of the Holy Spirit, and the face of God. So in this quote it says that uh, man is a captive of nature and ignorant of the divine world. Until born of the breast of the Holy Spirit, a recognition of one's true station beyond the confines of this simple world, the limitation and deprivation, and that we realize the narrow restrictions of the mere human world of existence and become conscious of the unlimited and infinite glories of the world of God. So in a sense, it's the ability for the embryo in the womb of the mother to realize that the body that it has, you know, if you will, like jammed up inside the womb, uh, which is actually even causing it discomfort, is itself limbs for that world beyond. So if you imagine if you actually were a fetus and um, you were in the womb of the mother and you wanted perfect comfort, you actually wanted perfect comfort, perfect joy in that world, what would you want? Not arms, not legs, or fingers and toes. You'd probably just want to be a round ball with a very large umbilical cord. <laughs> you'd want to be able to draw as much as you possibly could from the mother and not have these cramped legs and arms which in that world actually have no function whatsoever. However, in, if you were purely, if you were dedicating your life towards what is comfortable and pleasure and makes you happy in that world, when you were birthed into the next one, well, you would be a basketball and have nothing that you could possibly do, right? Whereas recognizing, if you will, the unlimited and infinite glories of the world of God, that these actual, these intellectual capacities, spiritual capacities, philanthropic deeds, self-sacrifice, knowledge of God, the love of God, are the way you build that elemental body that enables you to have time without time, place without place, and move through the worlds of God. If you were to realize that, then all of a sudden that which is uncomfortable in the womb, like the growing of appendages and even of eyes and ears and nose and tongue, which you're not even taking food through, uh, all of a sudden make sense. Suddenly they make sense because you understand the nature of the condition within you live. Then you will actually focus your energies and you would want stronger arms, stronger legs, better formed because you realize you're about to move into a world. Another analogy I often think of is imagine you're the, you know, the person that greets people as they come into an establishment. And you see this gentleman walk in and he goes off. And about, say, 30, 40 minutes later, the man walks up and begins to complain. And he says, you know, this is, this is the worst restaurant I've ever been in. Uh, the, the seats are hard. You know, the, the place is dingy, it kind of stinks, uh, the food is just garbage, it's just like, you know, basically fast food out of a, of a vending machine. And he begins to complain everything from the, the feel of it, the seats, the lighting, and he says to you, like, this is just absolutely the worst restaurant I've ever been in, in my life. And then you collect yourself for a moment and you say, well, 
Sure, that's because this is a gym. You're in a workout room. The point being here is that if this individual walks into a gym, a place where they're supposed to develop capacities, strengthen their body, right? Uh, or if they were to walk into a dojo thinking it's a spa, it, it, the way we actually approach that world is going to be completely and radically different. In the Baha'i writings, we're told explicitly that we're supposed to be developing or working out or learning our dojo skills, learning a martial art, and we should not get seduced by the fact, or if you will, sorry, the misunderstanding that we are in a spa or a restaurant. It's important that we can actually be in a gym and in a dojo the entire time thinking we're in a restaurant or in a spa, no matter what the maitre d' at the door says. No, moreover, it should one who hath attained unto these stations and embarked upon these journeys fall prey to pride and vainglory. He would at that very moment come to naught and return to the first step without realizing it. Now, here in the Gems of Divine Mysteries, Baha'u'llah adds another very frightening <laughs> uh, point is that we ourselves, and he's actually talking about parts of the Gems of Divine Mysteries are, are like the Seven Valleys, if you're familiar with the word, about the journey of the soul from the abode of dust into the celestial home, about our journey towards God and the purification of our own beings. And in this, he says that in moving through these, if we fall prey to pride or vainglory, we can actually return to the very beginning of our journey hell and not realize it. Mm -hmm.